Hey everybody, this is Pastor William Clark. I am the pastor of Living Faith Church here in the city of Hartford. I'm so glad to have you with me today. Now, we're getting ready to celebrate Good Friday, and I'm glad you're streaming in for this live service. And I, with a a number of pastors in the greater Hartford area, decided to get together and to share the last seven words of Jesus with you. You're going to hear from a number of pastors from different perspectives, from different cultures, from different experiences and backgrounds, and we're going to share what God has given given us regarding the last seven words of Jesus. Now, this is something that we typically do live, but we're doing it online and we're streaming it, and I'm super excited for what God is going to do uh, with this live stream today. So as we get ready to start this stream, I want you to sit back, I want you to grab a pen and paper, and I want you to take notes as you hear the word of the Lord shared, preached, taught with you tonight. Because as we explore the last seven words of Jesus, I want you to think about this. Now, while he said the last seven words before he died and before he ascended uh, to advocate for us on the right hand throne of God, Jesus shared these last seven words. And as we know that the words of Jesus, they are life, they are power, and they are a part of the gospel teaching. We learn from them and we glean from them. So I personally invite you to grab a pen and paper. I personally invite you to learn with me and to learn with everybody else that's going to be streaming online what Jesus Jesus is saying to us today in this season, we definitely need the word in 2020. And so with that being said, let's get started with our service tonight. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for your love. Your love is unlike no other. God, you have been the one to care for us and to bring us through every storm that we've encountered. And today we come to say thank you. We come to say thank you for salvation through the blood that you shed on Calvary, Father God, Jesus. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your protection and your shielding. The way that, Father God, you show us who we are in you. We thank you, God, for taking the time to teach us from your hand, to allow us to learn your word day after day, moment by moment. God, you're patient to teach us and to guide us through this life. We exalt your name and we say thank you. We thank you for provision and we thank you, O oh God, for guidance. We thank you, O oh God, for your spirit. We thank you for your comfort every single day. We thank you, Lord, for the ways you have defended us against the enemy. The ways, O oh Lord, you continue to fight on our behalf. O oh Lord, we exalt your name. We lift up our hands to worship you because, Heavenly Father, you alone are worthy. Thank you for all that you have done. Thank you for what you are doing right now. God, thank you for this day. God, many are confounded when they hear Good Friday. But Lord, it is good for us to know that we were loved so much. That Father God, you left your throne. You left, my Father Lord, your height to descend to our level. To show us how to live. To show us how to love. And Father, you died, conquered death, and gave us life through your bloodshed. Thank you for this true good news. And knowing that, Lord, we are no longer condemned. We are no longer, my Father, Lord, going to be cast away to hell. We are no longer, oh, my Father, with a vision, oh, Lord, of sadness and pain and depression. We are no longer bound to the things, my Father, and the limitations of this earth. But, Lord, we are free to live, God. We are free to grow. We are free to be more than conquerors through the blood of Jesus. And, God, we come to say thank you. Thank you for this moment that we can gather to learn of your word. And we ask you in the name of Jesus that you may inspire us, that you may fill us up, oh God, with knowledge of what you've done, how good you are. That, Father, the word may remain in our hearts to help us do every single day. Bless your men, O oh Lord God, your men servants that have taken the time to teach us, O oh God, of your word. Bless them in abundance. Bless their individual churches and continue to arm them, God, for the battle that many souls may come to know you as their personal savior. God, we love you. We exalt you. We praise you today. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Luke 23, 33 through 34. 
When they came to the place that is called the Skull, there they crucified him, and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's 9 a.m. Scripture says it was the third hour when they crucified him. It's killing time. Outside the Damascus gate is a road, and on the other side of the road is a flat area near the spot where the prophet Jeremiah is buried. Up above is a rocky outcropping that, if studied at a certain angle, looks like a skull. You can see eroded into the limestone two sockets for the eyes, a place for the nose, and a place also for the mouth. Skull Hill, they call it. Golgotha. Sometimes we refer to it as Calvary. Other times we call it Golgotha. You may wonder where the word Calvary comes from since it doesn't even appear in the Bible. There are actually three words used in different translations to describe this place. Golgotha is the Aramaic word for skull. The Greek word is cranion, from which we get our word cranium. And the Latin word for skull is calvaria. That's why we call it Calvary. This is the place where the Romans crucified their criminals. And they were ready to do their work. These Roman soldiers for, were from another part of the world. They weren't from Palestine. They didn't come from Israel. They weren't followers of Jewish law, nor did they care about the Jews' religion. They were simply soldiers who had a job to do. And it just so happened that they were on the death squad. They were in charge of crucifixions. On this particular Friday morning, their workload was a little bit lighter. Only three this week. They didn't know their names. They never did. And it didn't matter. They were just the executioners. From their point of view, it didn't pay to stop and think about what they did. They laid the cross on the ground, and they laid the body of Jesus on the cross. He moved and moaned, but they didn't care. One hand on one side, one on the other, rope, wrapping rope around his arm and, and around his leg, probably bent his legs a little bit, partially resting on a small platform, and they drove the spikes in. With the ropes in place, they began to pull the cross up. The wounds of Jesus spurts blood. And there he was, naked and exposed before the world, beaten and bruised and bloody, the soldiers stood back. They had finished their work. Jesus looks down upon the ones who had nailed him to the cross. He sees the crowd of people around him, those who mock him and plotted to put him on the cross. He sees others who were simply there because of the morbid fascination of what was going on. I think he also sees his disciples, who had all deserted him during his last hours, standing at a distance, horrified at what was now taking place in front of them. And while he is there, he says what is perhaps the most intriguing, amazing words ever spoken by our Savior. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Never will you hear the heart of God more clearly. Never could you find a better understanding of who God is and what he is like than when you hear Jesus utter those words. How could he say this? How could he look down at the very ones who had lied about him and falsely accused him and say those words? How could he see the very ones who had spit upon him and beat him and laughed at him? The ones who had spread false rumors about him, the ones who had mocked him, the very ones who still held the hammers in their hand. How could he see all this and still cry out for forgiveness? They were words no one would have expected. And yet, they are the fullest expression of his heart towards us. As he hangs between heaven and earth, his heart cries out to plead and and help us as our intercessor, giving himself so that man and God can live in communion with one another. These words are the expression, the fullest expression of his life's mission. He came for the very reason that we might be forgiven. It is the central focus of his mission. If there was anything that is truly unforgivable, it has to be this moment in time. 
when you crucify the Son of God, you have done that which is beyond forgiveness. If there is an unforgivable sin, it would surely have to be this. And yet, Jesus said in his first word from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Because he is fully God, he knows the absolute perfect holiness of God. That in God's presence there is not even the shadow of sin. Because he is fully God, he knows the extent of the terrible wrath of God towards sin. That he is angry at sin all day long. And because he is fully man, he knows the utter frailness of man. He knows our frame. That we are but dust. Because he knows God better than anyone. Because he knows man better than anyone. He cries out for that one thing that we need more desperately than anything else. Forgiveness. One question before we move on. When Jesus cries out, they do not know what they do. Who are they that he is referring to? Who is it that does not know what they do? Surely it was the crowd at his feet, the soldiers and the Romans and the mob and Pilate and Caiaphas and Annas and Judas and all the Jewish leaders. Surely Peter who had denied him, the disciples who had deserted him. None of them fully understood what they were doing. None of them fully understood the utter sinfulness of their sin. But you know who else is in that pronoun they do not know what they do? It is you and it is I. As he was praying for forgiveness, he was praying for you and he was praying for me because neither do we understand the terribleness of our sin. We minimize it. We rationalize it. Sometimes we ignore it. Sometimes we pretend it doesn't exist. Sometimes we say it's just a little mistake. We do not know what we do, nor do we fully understand the terrible price associated with our sin. And perhaps neither do we understand the depth of this irrational, endless, precious love that caused him to go to Golgotha to be nailed to the cross so that he could cry out and intercede on our behalf, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So today, we join our hearts with his heart, and we cry out once again for forgiveness, and we celebrate that it was granted because of his sacrifice. Great to be with you. My name is Steve Thiel. I'm the pastor of Christ Proclamation Church, and it's really a privilege to share a meditation with you from Luke 23, 43, where Jesus says to one of the criminals being crucified with him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, three thoughts that I have for you this evening. It's the context of Calvary, the contrast of Calvary, and the conversion of Calvary. So let's think about the context. There's three men being crucified by Roman soldiers. Jesus is in the middle. He's got one criminal on his left and one criminal on his right. But be clear, Jesus is innocent and these two men are criminals. They're being crucified for their crimes. Yet in that context, Jesus says, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Those are the facts. But there's also some irony at Calvary that the ones who are actually guilty are executing the only one who is innocent, or that they're accusing Jesus of blasphemy even as they hurl accusations at the Son of God, or the way they're mocking him as the king of the Jews when he's actually the king of all creation, or the way they're crying out for him to save himself, but if he saves himself, he can't be the savior of the world, or the reality that the one who gives life is the one who's dying and the ones that are dead in their trespasses and sins are the ones who need life. Those are the facts. That's the context of Calvary, which brings us to the contrast of Calvary because there's obviously two criminals being crucified, but they're radically different in their response to Jesus. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and save us. Now notice how worldly this man is. 
because all he cares about is himself. He doesn't care about right and wrong. He doesn't care about good and bad. He doesn't care about what's just or unjust. He only cares about himself getting off the cross. And he's happy to use Jesus to make that happen. Whereas the second criminal responds very differently. Verse 40, but the other criminal rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Couple observations. There's a radical change of heart here with this man. There's a fear of God before his eyes. That's why he says in verse 40, do you not fear God? Implying that he does have a fear of God before his eyes. He didn't before, but he does now. And he owns his sin. We are under the sentence of condemnation justly. We're receiving the due rewards of our deeds. And notice how he acknowledges that Jesus is innocent. This man has done nothing wrong wrong. And in that context, we get his confession of faith. Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. He acknowledges that Jesus is the king with all power and authority and ability to forgive. So he pleads for grace. That's the contrast of Calvary, which brings us to the conversion. Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, do you see the glory of grace here? This man is hanging on a cross, being crucified as the consequence of his crimes. So he's getting what he absolutely deserves, which is death. And not only physical death, but spiritual death. Separation from Christ for all eternity. That's what he deserves. And at this point, he knows it, he expects it, and he's content if that's what happens. But what does he receive? Grace undeserved kindness. Truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It's almost too good to be true because paradise for him was only moments away. All on the basis of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, he's going to receive life. But don't be confused here because grace is being freely offered and grace is being freely received, but grace is not free. It's on the basis of Jesus's willingness to be crucified, to endure the wrath of God on himself so that he can offer life, so that he can offer paradise to this man. And really that's the promise for every single one of us, that if we fear God, that if we own our sin, that if we accept the, the righteous judgment against our sin, that if we acknowledge Jesus as the sinless savior, if we confess him as king, and if we plead for grace, he offers life. He offers paradise. I hope that's an encouragement to you this Good Friday as you rejoice in your sinless savior and you look forward to the promise of paradise. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. And yes, I know, no. He holds my future And life is worth The living just Because he lives Because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because my Savior lives, all my fear is gone, and yes I know, no.
my future and life is worth the living just because he Hey everybody, my name is Dr. William Clark. I am the pastor of Living Faith Church here in the city of Hartford, and I'm excited to share a word of the Lord with you. As you know, this is the season where we celebrate the death, resurrection, and ascension of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. And this is also the season where we celebrate the last seven words of Jesus, and we try to glean just a little bit of information to advance our faith when Jesus was speaking his last seven words before he died. And I have the privilege to share a few words about the word of affection. We're going to be reading from John chapter 19, verse 25 and 26. And here's what the word of the Lord says. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. And when, and when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. This seems to be an appropriate word and message for us in this season. As we're dealing with and navigating quarantine, we are dealing with, with a brand new normal. Everything that we knew, everything that we understood about our everyday life has been turned upside down almost immediately. Think about it. We are used to going to work every day. We're used to getting up with our morning routine to get ready for work, to drive to work, work a full day and come back home and manage the routine at home. We've been used to managing our children with the routine, getting them up in the morning, getting them ready to go to school, taking them to the bus stop and then picking them up and spending time with them at home after we get home from work. We're used to spending our weekends going shopping, it's not too crowded, it's not too busy, but we would go wherever we wanted to go just to have a good time and decompress with our families. All of that has been taken away in short order and almost within a blink of an eye. And when we go through stuff like that, it puts us in a weird position where we start to wonder, what is normal anymore? Is our normal ever gonna come back? Are we gonna ever experience the things that we used to experience and am I gonna have to get used to something totally different? If you think about this and what Jesus was going through, he was getting ready to die. And think about the surrounding context of this. His mother who spent 33 years with her son, raising him and growing with him and building a relationship with him is all of a sudden getting ready to lose her son because of what can be perceived as a mistrial or as a bad and negative cir circumstance. Think about his disciples. They spent three years, three and a half years with Jesus, learning from him, growing under his tutelage and his leadership. And all of a sudden, the Savior who has been healing the sick, raising the dead, performing miracles that are just insane to believe and understand all of a sudden is getting ready to die they seen jesus raise his friend lazarus from the dead and he's going to die and give up his life everybody that got to know jesus everybody that got to experience jesus is now watching him transition to a different life a different perspective a different reality and this is what we're dealing with an immediate change that maybe many of us didn't expect to happen many of us may have seen the news in prior months about the coronavirus coming online but we didn't know it was going to hit us like this we didn't know it was going to hit our country like this our communities like this let alone the world community and this moment in time when Jesus told his mother to behold her son, he was helping her navigate through a new normal that was immediate. He knew that his work was not done. He had to die and ascend to heaven to advocate for all the believers that would believe on him. But he also knew that before he left, he needed to leave his mother with a tangible connection, a connection that many of us are craving right now. While we love our families and we love the people that we are living with, we also miss our colleagues, our coworkers, our friends, our extended family members. We miss uh, just being in the crowd with other people, other human beings. We are missing human interaction. And Jesus knew that the moment he died, his mother will be losing all connection, at least physical connection with him. And so he did her a favor. He did her a solid and said to her, woman, behold your son. This is now your son. This is now the man that's going to take my place physically as your son. And if you ever get lonely, if you ever miss me as your son, I want you to embrace this man, one of my disciples, as your son. This is an interesting turn of events for us. Not only is Jesus teaching us how to deal with change, immediate change, he's teaching us a lesson about this pandemic. He's teaching us that even though change has immediately taken place, 
things are no longer normal like we used to expect them. Our work is different. Homeschooling is now a norm for all families. And we are now quarantined within our homes. Jesus has given us insight on how to manage it. And his insight was in one of his last words when he said, woman, behold your son. If you've been working hard the past couple of years trying to provide for your family and create a new life and a better life for your family, you've likely missed some key moments with your children. And yet Jesus has given us awesome guidance and advice through his last words when he says, woman, behold your son. Maybe you've been doing all this other stuff to get ahead, taking uh, extra classes, getting a new degree, and you forgot what it meant to connect with your children. And when you get home, everybody's in their own world, doing their own thing on their own devices. And Jesus is giving us advice and saying, sir, behold your daughter. Perhaps you've been married for years and you've drifted apart and you don't know how to reconnect and you just can't find the time to connect because you have the kids and the job and the church and all this stuff going on. Jesus gave his advice, husband and wife, behold your spouse. This quarantine, while it's different, while it's immediate, while it has caused a seismic shift in our lives, Jesus's words to his mother were actually words spoken to us in this season. While we have the downtime while things are changing, while our normal is no longer normal, Jesus is telling us, take the opportunity to slow down and behold our families. We are now in the household with our families nearly 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if you've been desiring to reconnect with your children, behold your children. If you've been desiring to learn what they're going through and what school is like and what pressures they're under, now is the time, now is the season, as Jesus says, to behold your son, behold your daughter. And if you've been re wanting to reconnect with your spouse, would you just take this moment and embrace the words of Jesus and switch it around just a little bit? Sir, ma'am, behold your spouse. I pray that this word blesses you and that you not only celebrate the Easter season for what it is and what it means to our Christian faith, but I pray that this word speaks to you and speaks to your life because the beholding process, the journey of beholding our loved ones, connecting with our loved ones may not come again. And when things get back to normal, we're going to go back to what we used to do and what we like and maybe develop new things to do in the absence of our family. But instead of waiting for, quote, normal to come back, let's use this time to embrace the words of Jesus and behold the ones that are in our household. I pray that this word blesses you. And I pray that this Easter season is a blessed one for you and your family. God bless. Matthew 27, 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Pain, suffering, and trial are no strangers in our lives. The world we live in today reminds us of that constantly. Because of that, I find such a common reality ringing in this verse. When we are hurt, when we go through difficulty and darkness, we find ourselves wanting to call out this same thought to God. God, where are you? Have you left me alone? And while I do think there is a parallel here for us in our grief, Jesus' cry here is very different. In it we see not only the suffering of our Savior, but the hope of God and the great sacrifice that he was making on the cross. Jesus' words are not accidental. They are in fact a fulfillment of Psalm 21, 1, which says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This urge so familiar to us in pain actually points to a reality of something so great about Jesus' life and mission. Jesus' birth was marked with clear markers of God's purpose and blessing. From a supernatural conception, angels announcing his birth as not only the coming Messiah, but as the son of the living God, to miraculous strangers bearing gifts to a child, they bowed down and worshiped. At Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit declared that this was his beloved son with whom he was well pleased. 
And throughout Jesus' life, he never even flinched as the religious leaders of his days sought to challenge, belittle, and persecute him. So how did the Messiah, the Son of God, come to cry out such words? Well, these words for us point to a powerful truth for us. Christ was bearing the wrath of God against sin. Not just in theory, not just as a symbol. God is holy and completely just. And because of that, God must pour out his wrath on sin. This is hard for us to understand because of how temperamental and inconsistent we are as human beings. When we see someone else who gets very upset at a situation or another person, we often think of their own faults and it seems unjust. But God is not like us. He is just. He must punish sin. He must punish every lie, every theft, every evil thought, the serial murderer. He must pour his wrath against the human traffickers, against those who steal food from the poor, against Auschwitz and genocide, against every horrible, base, destructive, hurtful thought, action, motivation. And instead of us falling under that wave of holy justice, God crushes the Son of God. The wrath of God against every evil thing is poured out like a volcanic river on Jesus Christ. In some way, the God-man Jesus is bearing the result of sin, though he is sinless. But Jesus is not truly caught off guard. This is what he came to do. Hours before in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prays in preparation for his arrest and trial. In the garden, wrestling with what is about to happen, Jesus prays, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. The cup was God's wrath against sin about to be poured out. And as terrible as it, as it was, here's why it was done. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he, God, made him Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus bore the full wrath of God for us so that you and I could be given his righteousness and forgiveness. And Jesus did not flinch doing this. Hebrews 12.2 tells us that Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Think of that. Enduring the great wrath so that we could be forgiven was his joy. Shall the glory be Lest I forget Thy thorn crown brow Lead me to Calvary Lest I forget Gethsemane I 
like Mary through the gloom. Come with a gift to thee. The next word from Jesus on the cross is found in John chapter 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. Of all the statements Jesus made from the cross, these two little words, I thirst, most clearly reveal his humanity as well as the intensity of the suffering he bore for us. Up to now, through his arrest and trial, he has been whipped, he'd been beaten, the nails were driven through his hands and his feet. People taunted and jeered and spit at him. And yet, not once did Jesus utter a single murmur. But now, very, very close to the end, his whole body being racked with pain, with parched lips, he cries out, I thirst. It wasn't an appeal for pity nor a plea to alleviate his suffering, but it was an acknowledgement to the intensity of the agony he was bearing for us. Christ the man suffered. You know, there's no greater problem in the world than the problem of human suffering. How can a perfect, loving, powerful God allow so much suffering in our world? Nobody knows the troubles I've seen goes the words of the old African-American song that originated during our years of slavery. One of many expressions of that grief. There's no greater, deeper question than that of suffering. And here we are in the middle of a world crisis of epic proportion. The coronavirus has put global trade on hold, placed half of the world in, in confinement, has the potential to even topple governance. Many are dying, even more are sick. We're socially distant. The church is worshiping from afar. These are really scary and unprecedented and unparalleled times. And we ask, why should there be such pain and sickness and death? Why did my beloved child, why did my spouse, my mother or father die as they did? Why is there cancer and so much poverty for so many people in our world today? When we see it all and experience some of it ourselves, we cannot help but to ask the question, why? Does God see? Does God understand? Does God really care? And yet it's on the cross that we find that the answer to all those questions is yes. Yes, he does. Yes, the cross, you see, is God's solution to the curse of sin that's behind all of the brokenness in our world, all of the evil, all of the diseases. And the words, I thirst, well, they tell us that God not, not only knows the troubles we've seen, but he feels them too. God is not indifferent to human suffering and pain for the Savior experienced it. Jesus, though God, became human too, so he could suffer and die as a human to bear our sin. And in doing so, he entered into our experience. Hebrews 4.15 says, for we do not have a high priest who, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Our Redeemer is not removed from us. Rather, he enters sympathetically into our sorrows. For he himself was the man of sorrows. Is your body racked with pain? 
so was his. Are you misunderstood, misjudged, misrepresented? So was he. Have those who are nearest and dearest to you turned their back on you? They did the same to him. Are you suffering today from COVID-19? In this word, I thirst, we find comfort. God does understand. He's in the process of resolving sin and redeeming the world back to himself. That's what the cross is all about. But even now, he feels our pain. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. The songwriter continued, nobody knows but Jesus. No matter how despondent you are, no matter how rugged your path, no matter what you're going through, you can right now lay it all before the feet of the Lord Jesus. He knows. Do you thirst today? Of course you do. To a person who is thirsting for something better in her world, Jesus said this. He said, whoever drinks of the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. It will be come in him or her a spring of water welling up into eternal life. Amen. From the Gospel of John, the 19th chapter, verse 30, we hear these words from the cross. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. A few years ago, I was asked to be a part of an ecumenical service at a local church. We had seven pastors that were gonna come and speak for 15 minutes about each word from the cross. I remember it was going so well, and except when it came to the pastor before me, who tend to be a little long-winded, he went 50 minutes instead of his 15 minutes. The pastor that was hosting the event whispered to me across the state, Maynard, you need to make this short. You need to get it over with quickly. So when it got time for me to get up, I had the last word, it is finished. I went up to the microphone and I looked to the audience and said, Jesus said, it is finished. Then I turned to walk away from the microphone, but then I turned back and said, but that's not the end of the story. And it's not the end of the story because of the power of love. Huey Lewis wrote a song back in the 80s for the, the, the film Back to the Future called The Power of Love. Well, here we see the power of love from the cross. It's not the human love that Huey Lewis is singing about, because that's very limited. What we see from the cross, Paul wrote in his, to his letter to the Corinthians that it was the greatest love of all. The Greek call it agape love. You know, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily anger, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always persevere. Agape, the love that is part of God that caused him to send Jesus to the world. The love that Jesus lived and demonstrated to our world. The love that caused Jesus to die on the cross for our sin. And it's because of the power of agape love through this, though this act of love was finished, it's not the end of the story. Agape always has a resurrection. There is always a resurrection with agape love. Resurrection of broken relationship and to restored relationship. Resurrection of a lost life without hope and to a new creation full of hope. With agape, there is always a resurrection. 
Jesus' work on the cross may be finished, but because of the power of agape love, it is not the end of the story. And I'm so glad that you joined us for the first six words uh, that uh, we covered as it relates to Jesus' death. And this has been an incredible time for us as we've had the opportunity to share uh, in this joyous moment, in this joyous occasion. And I am so glad to be coming to you with the last words of Jesus before he took his last breath. And we're going to be coming out of Luke chapter 23, uh, verse 46. And here's what the word of the Lord says. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. This is the perfect way to end this celebration. You know, Jesus showing us what it means to humble oneself under the mighty hand of God. He simply said, Father, I commit my, my spirit unto you and I, into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. And he is showing us that ideally at the end of the day when we close this life out it is about submitting our spirit to him it is about submitting ourselves to god it is about submitting who we are to god but even before we take our last breath jesus he didn't just do this at the last moment jesus showed us how to do this the entire time he was in public ministry how many times did we find that jesus paused what he was doing to go pray and ask god for guidance how many times have we seen jesus pause and say father would you show me would you speak to me even before jesus was arrested jesus said father not my will but thine will be done after praying about this circumstance three times jesus showed us that the submission of ourselves our our spirit to God is normal practice. If we are to live a life that is fulfilled, if we are to live a life that is uh, thoughtful and, and impactful and, and resourceful for God's use, we have to get used to doing what Jesus said, which is, Father, into your hands I submit my spirit. Jesus taught a lesson in John chapter 4 when he said there's going to come a time that people of God, the people of God, must worship the God who is a spirit, and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. The worship process, the following of God, the obedience to his word, the obedience to his leading, is our submission in spirit. It is our worship in spirit. It is our response to the truth. Jesus knew that as he took his last breath, as he committed his spirit to God, he knew that this was his final act of worship. Jesus was created. He was sent down to be the perfect lamb of God, to submit himself to us, for us. He submitted himself to us so that we can have an example of what it means to live right today. In the midst of all circumstances, in the midst of all trials and temptation, Jesus showed us that even in our flesh, we have the blessed opportunity to represent God. We have the blessed opportunity to defeat the enemy and to tell the enemy, no, we're going to follow God. He also submitted not only himself to us, but he submitted himself to God. God wanted a perfect lamb. He knew that there were no goats, no sheep. There was no high priest that could represent the healing and restoration God knew we needed to be in his presence. And because he knew his son his only begotten son was the only gift that can make that happen. It was up to Jesus now to say, Father, I'm going to do your will and not mine. I'm going to submit myself to what you have requested and not mine. I'm going to make sure that your creation, these people who accept me, are given the opportunity to be in your presence, to come before your throne, and are given the opportunity to receive salvation and to live an everlasting life. And so when Jesus, at the end of it all, said, Father, into your hand, I commit my spirit, he is saying and signaling as he taught in John 4 that this is what worship looks like. The commitment process of our spirit is not only us saying, God, here I am to serve, but is also saying, God, here is the work and it is complete. What is God giving you to do? What has God called you to do within your life? 
What is God stationed for you to do in this lifetime? What is God expecting you to accomplish? You can't say that you're worshiping God until you say, Father, into your hand I commit my spirit. Not just when I die, but even while I'm living. Would you follow along with me and repeat after me and say, God, I commit my spirit to you. God, I commit my life to you. God, I commit my will to you. When you make that commitment, you are following in the footsteps of Jesus. That even before I take my last breath, it is about his will. It is about his purpose. It is about me worshiping him in spirit. That means the inward parts of me and in truth. It's about me submitting to him. And at the end of this life, can we with confidence, like Jesus, say, Father, into your hands, I'm going to give my spirit because I know I've done everything you asked me to do. I know I've done everything you wanted me to do. I know I've done everything that will make a difference in the life and salvation of your people. This is our aim for this life. This is our purpose for this life. This is why we live this life. It is to fulfill the purpose of God and to let God use us and for us to commit our spirit to him in the process. Hey, family, this is Dr. William Clark. We're back again. I'm so glad that you joined us for this live service. And we are so thankful that you hung in there with us and that you heard what God had to share with you tonight. Now, given that, I do want to provide an opportunity for anyone who watched this live stream. If you have not accepted Jesus as your savior and you want to say, hey, pastor, I want to be a part of the family. I want to join the kingdom of God. Then this is the right opportunity. This is the right time. What I want you to do simply is either leave a comment in this video chat whether it's on facebook or youtube and i want you to say pastor i want to be saved myself or someone from our team will contact you again just simply write the comment i want to be saved and we will follow up with you if you rather do this privately and email us then go ahead and email livingfaithct at gmail.com again that's livingfaith ct at gmail.com and i want you to simply type in in the subject line and in the body of the email i want to be saved again i want you to email me at livingfaithct at gmail.com in the subject and in the body i want you to write i want to be saved myself or someone from our team will get back with you and we will be glad to bring you into the family of God because Jesus as you learned tonight before he took his last breath he sacrificed everything for you and I and what we can do in exchange in return is to say Jesus thank you so much for saving me I will dedicate my life to you this day forward i'm so excited for you i'm so excited for those of you that are going to accept jesus i'm so excited to see the messages below and in our email inbox and i can't wait to usher you in into the kingdom of god now one more thing i personally invite you to join living faith church for service right here online you can stream uh, uh via the information below and we will provide a link before the service we're going to do it through zoom this sunday i want you to click on that zoom link in our facebook feed and i want you to join us this sunday at 10 a.m for easter service that's right 10 a.m for easter service i want you to join us online go ahead and stream click that zoom link we'll add this zoom link before sunday service join us i'll be glad to have you a part of our service on this sunday god bless we'll see you this sunday more precious than silver or gold. The blood that set me free, it came from a life of sin and tragedies. I'm born again, free from sin, because of the blood. Hey, 
Silver or gold 